Well, let me begin by saying thank you all for coming out this evening uh, and welcome to a meeting that, that we're looking forward to presenting. At this time, I'd like to introduce my colleagues over here. The first is Matthew Cooney, the second one is Kristen Lee, and the third is Jeremy Friesen. Um, so as we begin tonight, uh, I just want to set the stage with a couple of, of uh, things. First of all, uh, Glenrock Energy, tell you a little bit about them. They're a carbon management company, and they're located in Casper, Wyoming, been here for about five years, and they're also involved with an oil field that's near Glenrock, Wyoming. So let me start by giving you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm about 200, or 420 miles away. I live 15 miles from the Nebraska Panhandle, live on a farm, still engaged in agriculture, and I spent a lot of my life, 27 years, as a rural electric co-op director. And when I say a rural electric co-op director, it could be like Lower Valley or Bridger Valley electric in this part of the state. Had the good fortune of in the co-op program to be involved at a, at a regional and national level, state level as well, and uh, also had the good fortune of being on a what's called a GNT, and that's similar to Deseret. The one I was on was called Tri-State, which is an owner of Basin or of the uh, power plant in Wheatland, Wyoming, Laramie River Station. After I retired from the co-op. Uh, my years in the co-op family, I was involved in, in a lot of civic duties. I was with economic development, and uh, at one point, I decided I would run for a public office, and I was elected as a Goshen County Commissioner. While I was a Goshen County Commissioner, I was appointed by uh, Governor Mead to the Endow Executive Council, and uh, when I was a county commissioner, I also put in for an appointed position with the Trump administration, and uh, I resigned as a county commissioner and became uh, the uh, uh, rural development for USDA, the state director. So my role is with uh, Glenrock Energy is as policy advisor. And I got to know Glenrock Energy when I was with uh, USDA Rural Development. So this evening, what we want to talk about is how to repurpose camera coal, and by doing that, to retain jobs and, and create new ones as well. The purpose of the meeting tonight is actually two things. One is to inform you on, on what this project is going to entail, and the other is to have and receive your input as well. Now, I'm gonna put on my old hat as a Goshen County Commissioner, and I know we have several commissioners here, and I know if a project of this magnitude was coming into my county, I would have some concerns. I would be excited about the opportunity, but at the same time, I would be thinking, what's gonna be the impact of this upon the community? And then I'm going to put on my former USDA cap and say that there are certain things that's going to, going to probably need assistance, and that's where certain programs can be of assistance for infrastructure as well. Because it's not only creating new jobs, but there's going to be an impact to the community of, of when this project is being built. And so we're here tonight to to tell everyone in attendance that we want to be partners with the community moving forward. We have already started the process. We've been over here a couple times. We've met with, uh, with city council, with mayor, with county commissioners. So we began the dialogue. This past week, we had meetings with uh, the deputy director of the industrial siting council. So we begin the dialogue there with all the things that's going to be associated with with uh, siting of this project. But tonight we're here to begin a dialogue with the community to share with you what we're going to be doing in the future 
and also to listen to your concerns. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Jeremy Friesen, and he's going to share some information with you as well. well thanks, Wally, and uh, appreciate everyone's time coming up on a cold night. So I've, I've been here a couple times uh, last year for, uh, for events where we're trying to uh, engage uh, the, the uh, stakeholders, local stakeholders. Uh, recently moved out to Cheyenne from North Carolina uh, in, in July as, uh, because of the opportunity we, we've seen in, in, uh, in Wyoming and specifically in Kenner. And so you'll be seeing much more of me in the next few months and years. Uh, and we're really excited. Just some background. So I'm, I'm Jeremy Friesen, President of Canada America, which is the Canadian arm of Canada Clean Power and Climate Technologies based out of Alberta. We're an indigenous uh, co founded and investor, invested company, uh, a developed company around clean energy technologies. A uh, very strong team of professionals in engineering, professional engineers, and other uh, professionals who have uh, a deep experience in developing large energy infrastructure projects. Uh, so I'm happy to focus uh, that team on a project uh, in Wyoming. Uh, my, my background is, is mostly in the energy space, but I'm on the banking background, uh, banking side. I spent seven years at Morgan Stanley in New York uh, focusing on energy markets as a senior uh, strategist. I spent three years with a French bank called Sockgen, running a team, multi-asset team, but focusing on the energy market. And since 2016, I've been in the development, you know, clean energy development, uh, with two years in Silicon Valley on clean energy startups. And uh, as I mentioned, I just uh, came from North Carolina, where I spent three years as head of uh, business development at a clean energy company called Mentar, uh, just to join Canada uh, over a year ago. Uh, been, but been working with Glenrock and focus on, on this project since before then, uh, since I was at Net Power. And uh, I'm really excited to, to work with everyone here. And, and I see, you know, obviously our partners in Glenbach, but I see us all as partners together. There's a long way between here and, and uh, an operational uh, power plant. And, and uh, there's a lot of challenges that go through along the way. But we're excited to work with every one of you to get a project, a successful project here in Wyoming. Thanks. So, uh, good evening. I'm uh, Matt McCoon. I'm uh, the uh, Chief Financial Officer of Glenrock Energy. Well, I told you just now a little bit about our company based on Casper, Wyoming. Uh, my personal background is I, uh, I, before I joined Glenrock in 2018, before that I spent uh, 22 years working for a city group in New York. Spent pretty much all of my career working with energy companies. Was attracted to this particular one because of the huge opportunity we have here in Wyoming and also the unique uh, business model that uh, Glenrock brings um, combining carbon capture with upstream energy production. I'll tell you a little bit more about our project. Yeah. How carbonization works. It will be a uh, newly constructed facility uh, located at the site of the camera mine. It will repurpose the feedstock of the coal units of the not generation station, which, which you know are scheduled to be decommissioned in 2025. It'll uh, convert that coal, about 1.5 million tons per year, into carbon neutral ammonia. And in case you're asking you know, what exactly does that mean, carbon neutral ammonia, uh, the key thing is that all potential carbon emissions from producing ammonia are captured and secured and stored. And I'll talk more about that in a second, but uh, conventional ammonia, by contrast, releases large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere when it's produced. That won't be the case here. We will do so by combining uh, four key processes, and I'll, uh, I'll keep it high level, but those four key processes, they've all been around, some of these processes have been, have been around for, you know, most of them been around for many decades. It's coal gasification, ammonia production, uh, power generation, and um, carbon capture and sequestration. And again, all the potential carbon emissions from those processes will be captured and securely stored. This project, as you can imagine, will uh, provide several benefits to uh, your community. Um, most importantly, it will create or preserve hundreds 
of well-paying jobs. That includes the uh, jobs at the camera mine, where this facility will be a long-term, 30-year customer. It also includes um, jobs at the new facility, which will employ many people to produce ammonia. In addition to the uh, direct jobs, the hundreds of direct jobs, it will create uh, many indirect jobs. You know, typically a direct job creates you know, up to four indirect jobs. That includes other people involved in the uh, project elsewhere in the supply chain. It also includes the many businesses here in the Cameron Dineville area that, uh, that will be vendors to this project. And also we have to look at statistics here, just uh, what we're planning to do. We consume 1.5 million tons of coal, of coal per year, produce just under 700,000 um, tons of carbon fuel ammonia per year. Well, annual operating expenses is about 156 million. That's going to be spent uh, right here in the community. And we'll be, we'll be investing about $2.7 million right here to, uh, to build this facility. I kind of speak a little bit about why we chose to, um, to incorporate carbon neutral ammonia into this project. And quite simply, it's about converting coal from the camera mine into a carbon neutral product that can be easily, readily transported to customers elsewhere in Wyoming, elsewhere in the country, elsewhere in the world. And I say that because ammonia has a very uh, robust existing supply chain today. Ammonia can be and is transported by pipelines, rail cars, trucks, ships, what have you. In addition, ammonia is critically essential to, the, to our modern society. For instance, 85% of ammonia production today on a global basis is used to produce the agricultural fertilizer, which is absolutely necessary to, um, to feed the world's population. So by producing carbon neutral ammonia right here in Kemmerer, we're going to make Wyoming an important new supplier of ammonia. We're going to be doing so, we're going to enhance both energy security and also the security of the global food supply. Today, the U.S. is the number one importer of ammonia. The China and Russia are the number one and number two ammonia producing countries in the world. Over 70% of global ammonia production is from natural gas. So what we witnessed in terms of the war in Ukraine, the run of the natural gas prices, the shortage of natural gas, um, and the energy crisis in Europe, that's caused curtailments of global ammonia supply and a scarcity of ammonia, which as I mentioned before, is so important to modern society. In addition to fertilizer, ammonia can be used as a carbon-free fuel. When you burn ammonia, it doesn't give off carbon. In fact, ammonia has a very similar energy density to iron and coal. You can burn it in a power plant. So as a result of that, many power plants that currently consume iron and coal are candidates to be converted to ammonia combustion instead. I'd like to talk a little bit about something I mentioned before, which is CO2 sequestration. What exactly does that entail? Quite simply, it's taking carbon dioxide and securely and permanently storing it in rock formations deep underground. There's a couple of ways to do that. For instance, you may have heard about enhanced oil recovery or low carbon oil production, tertiary oil recovery. You can use carbon dioxide to produce more oil from mature fields. We call this low carbon oil production because when you combine carbon capture and tertiary oil recovery, you reduce the carbon emissions per barrel of oil by up to 63%. In addition, you don't need to produce oil. You can just drill wells and you can store carbon dioxide in deep saline reservoirs. We call this class six, which is an EPA classification, or sometimes referred to it as geological sequestration. All those alternatives are available right here at Cameron. There's many alternatives in terms of what we do to sequester the carbon dioxide that we captured. Um, for instance, we can drill class six wells at the site of the mine, or some other site nearby, here in the community, where we can store that CO2 underground locally. Or, we can partner with the owner and operator of a mature oil field here in the basin that wants to implement low carbon oil production. We could also build a 20 mile pipeline spur to transport CO2 and tie into the existing network of carbon dioxide pipelines 
that currently transport carbon dioxide throughout Wyoming. And then finally, we can aggregate that CO2 from with that of other car, other emitters that wish to do carbon capture here in Wyoming, develop a CO2 sequestration hub in Southwest Wyoming. We come kind of to the next slide, the refers to the profitability of the project. Guy kind of that asked at times, and this sounds pretty interesting. Can you actually make money in this? Can you generate a profit to cover the costs of building this, this facility? Happy to report that the answer is yes. Based on the preliminary economic analysis we've done, I'm an accountant by trading, so I spend a lot of time looking at numbers here. Um, our cost to produce carbon neutral ammonia from chemical coal will be below the current 10-year average market cost of conventional ammonia. So we can produce carbon neutral ammonia with a lower production cost than conventional ammonia today. And again, because this is a project being built uh, by a private enterprise, uh, it will be profitable. That profit motive provides a very strong incentive to move the project forward, to promise on what we're saying, and to bring it on on time, on, bu on budget, Scope. Before I talk about this, a, little bit, a little bit about how we intend to, uh, to finance the project, you know, we acknowledge this is a large project. It takes a long time to build a project like this. It takes a lot of money. But I'll tell you that the, uh, there's a second, it's called the Section 45Q tax credit available from the U.S. government. We get a, um, a tax credit of up to $85 for every ton of carbon dioxide that we capture in the security store. In the case of this project, we'll be capturing and securing the story about 2.5 million tons of carbon, carbon dioxide per year. So that, meaning the tax credit we receive from the U.S. government, will be the single largest source of funding. It'll require some additional capital, though, that we're very focused today on putting together a group of strategic and financial partners that will provide that capital. And we'll also include a customer, a long-term off-taker for the carbon neutral ammonia that will be released. <laughs> Again, as a support, given the fact that we have multiple options available to store the carbon dioxide at the site, that makes it even more attractive to potential financing parties. So finally, before I turn the presentation over to Tristan, why don't you discuss some of the uh, some of the benefits of this project? And this is some some of which we've uh, we've already touched on before. Um, we're reducing carbon emissions by uh, providing carbon neutral ammonia. We are providing a sustainable, ongoing market for Wyoming's energy resources, and specifically the chemical coal produced right here. We're utilizing existing infrastructure and resources, providing and preserving and creating well-paying employment, other economic benefits. And we're avoiding just the, the devastating economic consequences of people prematurely abandoning fossil energy infrastructure. Just one final note uh, on timing. Yeah, I've been asked a couple times even this evening, you know, when, when will we do this? When, when can you build this project? And again, I, yeah, we acknowledge this is a big project. It takes a long time. There's a lot of long lead time stuff here. But I'll tell you what our current expectation is. I'll tell you what we're working for. Uh, there is an expected 12 to 18 months pre-construction period. That's when we complete the engineering and the permitting for the project. I say 12 to 18 months because the permitting is that's beyond our control. So we say it takes up to 18 months. Once that phase is complete, we will um, begin the construction phase. It'll take about three years to build a facility like this. We could potentially break parts of the online sooner. We might be able to begin producing ammonia and gasifying coal earlier and generating power later if there's some long lead time items like turbines there. So if, all that, if we stick to that uh, schedule, we will be operational sometime in early 2027. And obviously, it's not possible for, for, for me or for anybody else to predict the future. But what I can tell you is that we're committed to doing this, that every, every day, every week, every month that goes by, it becomes clear that we're making good progress to, um, to, to, to meeting that goal. So again, thanks for your attention. That's the project. I will now turn the presentation over to Kristen Lee. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Kristen, and I'm with the government outreach team for Glenmark Energy. I'm in Cheyenne, and 
I think tonight my claim to fame is that I was in the same law school class as District Court Judge Joe Bunnell, who's here. So um, I guess, uh, actually I can tell you a story about Judge Bunnell. <laughs> now that I think about it, he spent a summer as kind of this uh, running errands for a professor that was putting a seminar together, and Joe and I were the ones doing all the copying, and we were saying, wow, we went to law school for this. But we were really good copying. We ran that machine really well. But um, so as part of our, our outreach, right, these are wonderful, wonderful projects, but they also come with questions and concerns about infrastructure and water and roads and police and fire, and the impact to the schools. I mean, what what is the impact? And we don't really know, but we know it's the impact of, of people and of um, and, and maybe we do know, right? We've watched Gillette. Gillette had some um, growth. We've watched Wheatland when the Larry River Station was built. And so uh, Wyoming can, does know what they're doing. And I even think Douglas, right, with the big oil boom when they had um, four people to every hotel room. And there's, there are some social pressures that we acknowledge as we go. And that's part of our outreach tonight is to say, as we go, we need to work with your local officials, your city officials, your city administrators, your county commissioners, your elected officials, um, and uh, the senators and representatives. Keep everyone informed as we go. And then through the industrial siting permitting process, there's always impact fees that we pay that get distributed then to the police and the, the fire. But um, that's really <clears throat> what we're doing here today. Letting you know about the project, letting you know who we are, and then letting you know that, uh, and I don't really know if we plan to be here every quarter, or maybe every three months, every four months, and keep you apprised of how it's going, and then understand the impacts better so that way it can be addressed. And I think too, as we work through the industrial siting process, work through that so we can actually present that plan to the council and uh, for its approval. But so that's who we are. We're the technical piece, the financial piece, the government outreach piece, the partner, Canada America. 